what that word looks like. Um, this is a thermal infrared imaging camera. Um, this is the latest model. I bought one about three and a half years ago. Um, this one has a few more bells and whistles than mine does, and you'll, I'll point out the differences between the pictures from my older camera and this new one. But there are a couple of nice things about it, but essentially it's the same image resolution camera, it does the same job. Uh, this one now belongs to the ATA, so as, as Steve said, you can hire it out and use it for yourself for taking photographs. Um, I'll show you some of the work that I've done, some of the serious pictures, some of the more novelty pictures, and point out a few of the traps that you may encounter when you, try, when you start taking pictures of one of these units. Uh, it does come with a bit of software, so Steve promised me that you can open the pictures up without having to refer to the software. I've thrown the software in as well just to make it a bit easier so you can see some of the pictures. But you can certainly load the pictures straight into your normal computer. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is though that the pictures on here, the resolution size, we're used to 10 and 20 megapixel cameras, or 24 megapixel cameras, um, this thing runs out at about 10,000 pixels. A little bit smaller. So the pixels are larger and therefore a little bit chunkier. Uh, and depending on what you want to do with them, you, you can post-process them, which I've done with Hume. You'll see the differences between them. Or you can actually work it within the Flow software itself, where it then blows up the pictures a bit more for you. That's a bit bigger. Now, the first thing to start with um, is what does a thermal imaging camera do? Um, it's a camera, it takes images in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, our eyes see in the electromagnetic spectrum, and that's what I've got tagged down here that our eyes see basically the red, green, blue region. This is our visible spectrum, and if you move it up into the total area, you'll see that our eyesight is fairly limited in the width that it can see. The usual range that we look at is around 700 nanometers to 400 nanometers, or 0.7 to 0.4 of a micron, if you want to go to micron terms as opposed to nanometers. So it's a very, very narrow part of the total spectrum. Uh, you can get security cameras, which they talk about as infrared cameras. Those cameras work at about one micrometer, just beyond what our eyes can see. And for the security cameras that you may have at your home, they have to have infrared diodes that push out infrared light, out, and then that light is reflected back off of the surface. And then your cameras can then see those, what they class as infrared image. And that's really short wavelength infrared. These cameras are very, very different. They can only see this region, which is between 7.5 and, and 13 micrometers. Way, way, way beyond what our eyes can possibly see. Uh, and the major thing is that these cameras take images of heat that is radiated out of the surface. It doesn't show reflective heat at all. It shows radiated heat energy. The point of picture of the person, you can, you can see the heat energy radiating out of the person. If I've got a sore muscle, you can see the different temperature colour of a sore muscle compared to a part of the body that isn't sore. You'll see, you photograph your head, you see different temperature zones in your head, etc. Because there's heat energy radiating out. And the view of using these sort of cameras in buildings is that you can take photographs of walls and ceilings, around windows, etc. And you see where the heat is radiating out or coming off based on where you lose it. In the cold areas, you, you get cold colours. Um, there's a few interesting little traps with it, but that's essentially what we do, and I'll show you some of those pictures, but that's the important part to keep in mind is that our eyes can only see a very, very narrow spectrum. Infrared cameras go to one micrometer, and this thing moves a long way into the infrared region, long way, long way into the red. Just to give, so to give you some idea where some of the other things are, we have x-rays, if you get x-rays done, they're down here. Gamma radiation way down here, the tiny end. If you listen to the radio, then the radio frequencies are way up at this end. And it's all electromagnetic spectrum, it's all stuff that travels at the speed of light. Does that all make sense? Are you saying that by the radiation, the infrared coming out of the building, you can photograph it easily? Does that equally apply to our other night pitch dark? Yep. 
You can see the orange. Take beautiful, orange beautiful pictures in pitch blackness. You can pick up the heat from the cameras. Yes, it's true. You can pick up heat from anything outside. Uh, occasionally you'll see the police searches when they're chasing somebody from the helicopter. They'll actually use these images and they, they use a black and white image. And you can see this little white blob racing around and hiding behind bushes and all of it. <laughs> That's a thermal imaging camera, but it's about a forty to fifty thousand dollar camera. Um, this one, bit, I think, is a bit under two thousand. Fourteen hundred. The one I bought three and a half years ago was two thousand dollars. So, not quite up to the resolution capacity of the police radar, the police infrared cameras. The beauty of this little package is it'll do ordinary pictures as well as special uh, FLIR pictures. Oh, the word FLIR, F-L-I-R, stands for forward-looking infrared radar, and which was originally developed by the military so they could shoot people in the dark. Yeah. Now, this is, this is a standard picture, it's not a special thermal picture at all. I'm using this just to show the difference you get between the colouring you can select. This camera will do the same as mine. This is a standard photograph, inverter system in my house. So you can see what the, the, the standard picture looks like. I I'll get this with a stiff neck looking this way, I think. Um, if I move on to the next picture, this is a thermal infrared image of the same inverter using black and white imaging or grayscale imaging. You can see the resolution is much, much lower, and that's because it's only a, a 10,000 pixel as opposed to a 10 megapixel image sensor. The newer camera, they've actually got a nice little thing with that. They've combined a small digital camera with the thermal camera, and they're actually creating nice edge effects, so you can get sharper edges with this camera than you can with mine. But, but anyway, that, that's one of the colours. So if you want to have things in black and white, um, that's one of the colours you can use. If you go to the next one, they have what they call the iron colours, where the, you get through a colour a gradient range of the darkest colours are the coldest areas, the whites are the hottest. And you see, essentially you can see the temperature scale going up on the side there and the temperature, the temperature it just has been changed. The, the black areas is away from the inverter. The white area is actually the, the, the exhaust area for the inverter there where there's a fan blow hot area. So you'll see the heat coming out of the inverter at that point. If you don't like that colour, you can then select another colour. A little bit more colourful. Surprise, surprise, they're called rainbow colours. Uh, and that lets you look at the, the same sort of effect, but with a different colour spectrum. So essentially what goes on inside the little thermal camera is that it sees its wavelength at a very, very long infrared, that it's impossible for our eyes to see. It does a bit of magic and it converts it to a visible picture. Then it says, well, how would you like the picture? Black scrap, black, einstein or rainbow colours. And so it then electronically converts that very long wavelength into a visible light that we can see in our screen. So, but, but that's, you know, that and that's also, the, also those shows that one example of what you can use is you can actually use these cameras to take photographs of equipment, electrical or mechanical equipment, to see where the hotspots are and see if there's anything unusual going on. And if you want to see just a little bit of a novelty one here, you want to see who's been sitting in your chair or how much each your body puts out. The left hand side is just a normal lounge chair. And five minutes after I got out of it, I got my camera out and decided to photograph on our shed. And you can see the residual heat still radiating out of the chair. And as all of you know, if you go and sit in a the chair, then someone's been sitting on you suddenly feels nice and warm. This camera can photograph how warm it is. And it actually gives you the direct the amount of, of temperature in, in the temperature scale there. And again, it shows you that the blue is the coldest and the white is the hottest. So, a bit of a novelty thing, but it, it shows really that the hidden stuff that is there. Our eyes can't see it, but it is still there. And if you want to do something else a little bit different, a bit hard to see on that one there, but what, the, what I'm doing there, I'm just taking a photograph of the thermal convection currents in the saucepan heading up water. You can actually see the temperature go out gradient as the water moves around and circulates around. Now, also, that particular image is the first of the ones that show how the, the software works with the image itself. We've got more on the right hand side, there's more data about the image itself. Uh, tell us the emissivity of the camera, the date the picture was taken, temperature range and the whole works. Now all of that comes up if you use the first software, we show you all of that data on the picture. Also, if you want to take a reading somewhere else, you can just grab the cross here, move it across, It'll then give you the reading at that particular point. 
But most of the feature if you want to move around and have a look at the image on the screen itself. Um, and you can see here, there's the temperature range down there, the measurement range. This one thing I actually better mention about this thing called emissivity. Uh, it's a technical term, obviously, uh, and it relates to the level of reflection of a surface. If you have a surface that has very, very little reflection, any infrared that radiates out of it is basically exactly what you're seeing. If you have a reflective surface, then the what you, what you get is a combination of the reflection from the reflected surface plus the radiated surface. And the trouble is the reflected image is a thermal infrared image as well. So if you, it's very easy to, read, to misread what you're seeing at times. And, and what you can do with the camera though is you can change and change this emissivity setting so that you can actually hide the reflected thermal infrared and see the radiated infrared instead. So this thing called emissivity allows you to change that and, and all different materials have different emissivity values. The, um, the emissivity value in this one is at loss. Yeah. So it's quite easy. Yeah. So you, you start off with an emissivity of one which is completely max surface. If you want to do it, an emissivity of glass it comes down to about point 0.1 because glass is very reflective. It causes all sorts of problems and apart from if the camera can't see through glass anyway. More of that in a moment. I'd like to save it. Uh, we'll discard that. Go to the next picture. Here's another picture here again with the using the, the uh, first software. And that unusual looking gadget is my solar hot water system, and it's showing the plumbing coming out of the side of it. And this little black blob here is a mixer valve, where it's actually mixing the very very hot water coming out of the hot water system with cold water. Um, and normally, if you basically, it's a legal requirement to have that hot water that comes into your bathroom and so on, it's not allowed to be hotter than 45 degrees, and the other parts of the room is 65 degrees. So you get two categories of, of mixer valves that actually mix the hot water coming out of the solar hot water system, which on a 40 degree day, that water can get 95, 96 degrees Celsius. So it mixes the cold water with that, and it brings down the safer water down into your house. And that's just a thermal image showing that this, this, this section here is the, sort of showing me what the temperatures are. That's the very hot water coming out, cold water coming in down the bottom, mixing it. Then there's an insulated tube there, so you can't see much heat coming out of that. And that's then the water going inside the house. But we just, again, I was just testing to have a look and see if I could photograph how a mixer, a mixer valve worked and if it showed the temperature differences on a solar hot water system. Do I know what that is? Radiator or something? No, it's what? Some sort of heating device? Radiator? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not an intentional heating device. Oh, oh, no. It's a battery charge. Oh, battery charge. Yeah. It's a battery charge. Yeah. Charging a set of double A batteries. Oh, yeah. Um, we can see the two batteries are very hot and two aren't quite so hot. A couple of dots. So what they just actually showing up with that little battery charger, it's a four pack double A battery charger. Um, what it's showing is that the two white batteries are fully charged and they are sitting at just under 70 degrees Celsius. The cooler batteries, if I drag it down to there, is down to 63 degrees. So if, that's your, if you happen to photograph a battery charge and you see that happening, the 70 degree batteries are being cooked and they're being destroyed slowly. Mm. You rip them out, take them out of the way and just charge the two ones that only partly charged. And that way you get nice uniform charging. Now this can be done with quite large battery banks. I mean this is only double A batteries, but you could, you could even do the same thing with quite large battery banks and go and photograph the hot large battery bank and work out whether you've got any problem areas in those battery banks. Mm. Uh, uh, unfortunately this is a rather blurred sort of a picture but it's quite a big idea of the text. This is one I'll, I'll grab the image out of the camera, put it in my computer there, added extra text to it and put it back in again. Um, so it's, it's a mixture of merged pictures and, and extra text. It's a PowerPoint, standard PowerPoint, double point PowerPoint. You've got one plug in sitting in here, and there's empty socket down here with the three pin hole, you can see. Um, so 15 amp power aspect, so it's designed for air conditioners. And we can see that the temperature where the plug is between the switch and the plug is running at a maximum of 55 degrees Celsius. If you put your finger on there to try and touch that plug, you'll burn your finger. 
no power pump is that hot or the air conditioner was running. If you get oxidisation occurring on the copper inside those contacts, that point will go for 70 or 80 or 90 degrees or even hotter, and next thing you know you've got a fire in the power pump. It'll be quite dangerous. And I can't believe that because I took it out of the computer and put it back in again after playing around with it. Um, another application here, I had a company rang up a while ago and said, can you come and try and photograph this in thermal photography and ordinary photography on some solar panels? These panels have got cracks in them and they're worried about the solar panels starting a fire. So I got a couple of shots here and I was taking a whole lot of photographs of what are called micro cracks in some of the new panels. Very, very fine microscopic cracks. And I, I photographed them for them and had some real fun trying to get that photograph. But I also thought, well, I'll try some thermal pictures. Um, and so what I did was I took three different sets of pictures. Now, these I had to take out because these are actually six pictures. Each of these images of the solar panels are six photographs that I've merged together to make a larger picture. So the left-hand one is the solar panel sitting out in the open, no wires connected, open circuit, no electric current flowing, just simply the sunlight hitting it. I left it there for about five minutes and then photographed the surface. And for those of you familiar with it, I photographed the glass side, which you shouldn't do. I thought, well, if I do the same thing with all three pictures, the areas that I'm seeing will be what will be balanced out. The white spot at the top is the junction box where the cables connect in, so that's just one local hot spot there from the panel. I then put a load onto the solar panel and two and a half amps of electric current were flowing to the solar panel and the different temperatures started to rising. And then I put it up to its maximum, pumped seven and a half amps through it. This was the thing was out facing the nice bright clear sunlight. Put some loads onto the solar panel and forced seven and a half amps of electric current to the panels. And I then had a take the photographs, of course my camera can't do fine grid lights like a new one can. I then had to draw the lines where the cells are for the whole solar panel and try and work out what was going on. And so you then start to now see huge temperature variations in individual solar panels in the main whole solar panel, in the, in the solar cells in the whole solar panel. One very, very hot one. And I had been expecting to actually see thermal differences where the cracked panels were. And I had a seize on the panel on the cells that are cracked. No, my, not a problem. Ooh. But this poor cell up here was really working its hard out. <laughs> uh, the interesting technical question is how, how well was the whole solar panel working? Um, all of those cells are connected in series. So supposedly the same electric current, or actually in reality the same electric current flows through each of those cells. And those cells all have different temperatures. So an interesting technical problem was arising there with the one poor cell that was very, very hot. Uh, and what it shows up is the fact that when manufacturers make solar panels, or solar cells, to build a solar panel, they make them in varying grades of quality. The poor quality one would be the one hot cell that just got mixed up in the back somewhere, and the other ones in a slightly higher quality and are more uniform in the, in the temperature emission. Um, so that, that's, again, a fairly practical use of the thermal camera then to actually photograph these. But the, the one problem you get there is, is coming back to this emissivity thing, is that the thermal camera cannot see through glass and you have a glass front on the solar panel. So you've got to wind the emissivity right back to minimise the reflection, because otherwise, seeing the panels are sitting up and facing the sky, all it would have got was a reflection of the sky, and which would have been about minus 20 degrees Celsius. So it was a trick exercise to getting hold of those pictures there. But they did certainly show a good picture and, and also to show the fact that the crack, micro crack cells were not overly stressing the whole solar panel. So with that, the angle yeah. of looking at it, you'd, you'd want to make sure sort of you didn't have the sun sort of in your complementary angle. Of, yeah. uh, so it's quite difficult to... Of course, it was very difficult, difficult to get yeah. them and then taking six pictures and then combining six pictures and blending them. Did you together. find a sort of a, a good angle or sort <laughs> yeah, of 90 degrees? Or? I kept myself out of the park for a while because otherwise I'd be in the picture too. <laughs> so a couple of those later in a minute. Um, solar panels make good heat shields. Pro probably it's got a shadow blinds. Here's a photograph of my underside of my carport with all the reinforcing that carried the solar array. And here's a thermal image of the same scene. Uh, there's no solar panels here on this side where all the red and the white is. 
that that's nice and hot. Um, should be a temperature gauge here showing it's up around the 50 degree, 50 degree mark. And the colder air is the blue, and the blues and the greens and over the solar panels. Like the difference, I think, is 20 degrees. What's that? So, yeah. And the interesting question is, what's happening to all the extra heat falling on the solar panel? Why isn't it coming through the roof? What's a solar panel do? It makes electricity, doesn't it? The temperature difference is the electricity that's being created. There you go, there you go. Oh, the shadow. Shadow. Yeah. The shadow. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and that's the thing, if you, if you take a photograph of a solar panel that is not connected to anything, its temperature will rise to the same temperature of a steel roof. If you then make it work, plug it in and get it working, it cools down. A working solar panel is colder than a not working solar panel. Totally reverse of your normal concept of thermodynamics. Because what happens is that it converts that radiant energy into electricity. So it extracts energy and therefore the whole thing runs cooler. Anyway, we won't go too much into the physics of that. Now, into the, into the household, this is where most of you might, if you're behind the scene, you might, this is what the sort of thing you'd be doing at home. Left hand picture is the corner of my dining room, and the right hand picture then is a thermal image where I've photographed the ceiling. Most peculiar shape appeared up there. I was experimenting with my camera and taking photographs all over the place. I thought, well, I might as well do something useful. I'll start photographing my outside the house, seeing that's what I was intending to do with the camera. Um, really weird shapes of very hot spots and all the rest. So I clambered up on the roof, pulled some tiles off, and then I worked out what all was going on up there. We've got the blow-in insulation on the roof, the cellulose blow-in insulation. And in that corner, the wind turbulence coming through the tiles had blown with the turbulence and blown some of the insulation off, so there's only the chip rocks in there. And then with the little strains of, of where eddy currents have been in the roof over the years, and have moved the insulation out of the way. And so that was where those funny squiggles were coming from, was actually where the eddy currents have moved the insulation, the blowing insulation. Yeah. I'll be up there and got the rack out and put the sand dust up back, back again, and put, put a bit of an extra fiberglass bat on top of it, and it was right. But yeah, quite a surprising effect there. Um, another, another example here in the house. Top image, I've got some text with it there that this is the back veranda. I actually designed it to be a nice passive energy efficient back veranda. Um, so this is a top image of the normal picture. It's a short to the shape. Um, air soil insulation, the ceiling, nice gaps so that the roof was nice and insulated. I had the the upper, the upper windows here actually face north, but I've got about 800 millimeter overhang, so none of the summer sun comes in through those windows. Uh, on the southern wall, I've got nice big glass walls there with double, uh, um, not double, double, double layer laminated you know, comfort plus glass, very, very lovely plus glass. And, and the glass up on the top windows up there, slightly different con conductivity glass to let the winter sun come in, because the winter sun comes in fairly flat and it'll come out underneath the eaves and then warm, warm the back veranda up. A reverse brick veneer wall on the southern side so when the sun dies it comes in we'll then warm up the brick wall. The only thing I've completely forgot was the ends of the door, of the wall, of the building. Um, this is eastern, this is the east facing panel, pretty well close to the east. Um, photograph I took in the morning, about half past nine in the morning. The cooler parts the blue parts down to that are about 18 degrees Celsius, and that particular panel there was up at 34 degrees, half past nine in the morning. So if there's a beautiful radiator, and all of those was a fibrous cement sheet, nothing else there. Lovely radiator to put the punch, punch the heat in through the morning to warm the back veranda up, which I didn't want. And then that night I went back, fairly late at night, at quarter to 11, the house, the veranda warmed up, so the inside of the veranda was then about 23 degrees, and that triangular panel was then down to 15 degrees. So all the warmth that built up in there was oozing out through that one panel. Caught out even for all the care that I put into the rest of the design, and got caught out completely on the side. The other side was fine. They, on, the, on the western side, I put the double lining on, that was okay. Forget that, forget that one. Where you do? 
So what I did, if you can see there's a steel tubing around here, I actually got some rigid foam, foam insulation, aluminium plate, tatted, fitted it into there and put a thin um, MDF skin over the outside and closed and boxed the whole lot in. And a subsequent photograph taken on a very hot day, like about mid-morning, now shows you that panel now. And temperature-wise, we had 32 degrees in the coolest area. This is one of these 44 degree days. And uh, we went right up to 48 degrees on the hottest part. The hottest part, the white you can see, is the gutter. It's a box gutter area. So that, that triangular panel, which was going through this huge temperature extremes, now is no hotter than the fully insulated roof. Mm. And the hotter parts now becomes the, the gutter itself. So I have to flat the gutter now to keep the heat right out through the gutter. <laughs> so you, know, you fix up one problem, you realise you've got another one. But that was how effective it was. Um, <coughs> The piece of polystyrene foam, not the polystyrene, but the high density uh, insulation foam that I got was thrown away from someone else who had finished doing their house and they said, I oh, want you to chuck all this away and have something for life. So the foam cost me nothing. The MDF sheet it cost me about $20. A coat of paint on it, did it all myself. So, and, and that made quite a noticeable difference to the back veranda. That's right, that you put in there, the yeah. insulation. So, yeah. is that the west end of the veranda? It's a what? It's the western end. Eastern end. Cat's morning sun. Yeah. Oh, there was one on the western end, but that, that stuff was differently done. There's a carport there too. Um, another area there, I photographed the inside of the lounge room. This is a Higginbottom house built in the late 60s, so it's getting on 50 years old. Um, and I thought, well, I'll go and take some other photographs. And, and this is the way that the houses were built back then. Nice big windows. The double brick wall, air vents for, because you've got gas, space, uh, space gas heater in there. But then there's also this inset above the window. Uh, and that's what I found out once I'd taken these photographs. This is a summer photograph and there's a winter photograph. Was it, again, one sheet of fibro cement and it opens up straight into the roof space. So what we had here, this is the summertime. Uh, air conditioner running, nice and cool. There's an evaporative air cooling system, so I was pump, pumping air through, pushing air through the vents. Uh, corners of the room, which are very hard to insulate, but this panel here was very, very hot. So you've got all this heat to do, again, from the roof cavity straight into the lounge room, and every window in the house was like this. Every single window in the house. So I waited till winter time and repeated the process, heated the lounge room up, and consequently, this thing was nice and cold. The cold was here was 17 and a half degrees, which is that piece above the window, and 24 degrees for the rest of the house, or the curtains and the, and the rest of the area was 24 degrees. So again, trying to warm up the lounge room, but a huge panel was sucking the warmth out of that room and every room in the house. Um, and what I did there was that I exactly the same as there with the triangle section, had some more of that rigid insulation, infilled it up in here, piece of 6mm MDF in front of MDF sheeting in front of it, closed it off, sealed it up and consequently no more heat loss. Again quite simple, passive, passive process um, and we can see now that what now was a very very cold section in the middle of winter, this is a winter shot again with the heater going, hot air going out through our exhaust vents with the space heating I lounge them so I'll allow for some of that to happen. Um, the roof's nice and warm now, the curtains are nice and warm, the film is warm, and that piece that was dead cold is now nice and warm. It's actually a whole lot warmer than the brick walls. And again, so I've, I've done, I've got two more of these panels to do, they're the smaller ones. Um, but all up, I guess it probably cost me about $200 to make that improvement. And, and during the winter then, when I took that photograph and we checked the gas bill afterwards, the gas heating bill afterwards, because I heard you notice I was turning the, the temperature control down to hold the house at about 22, 23 degrees. I reckon I turned it down about 20%. Uh, and our gas consumption said went down by about 10% purely by doing that. Cost effective. Mm. Now, I mentioned to you about being careful about reflections. This is a panorama of about eight photographs that I took with a thermal camera. Uh, and that's actually the window looking out into the backyard. Except 
the camera cannot see through, as I mentioned, it cannot see through glass. The only thing the camera sees is the thermal reflection inside the glass. So here's your truly very, very conspicuous portrait right there. <laughs> and the other intriguing part is you then look at the wife's sort of going to stuck all sorts of things along the window shelf, and you can see the the yellow temperatures here that are ref the thermal reflection of the face. Here there's some, some empty bottles. I'll drink the contents first. Um, but the face, face in the glass is warmer than that face in the back veranda. So the, the front face of the glass is warmer and then the thermal image picks up the warmth and is reflecting back the thermal warmth of the empty bottles. It is not seeing anything outside in the glass. Real trap. And same with everything else sitting on there. The reflection we're seeing in the glass is a thermal, is a reflection of the thermal objects. And when there's a few degrees difference between the face on the inside of the veranda and that face in the glass surface. And that, that's probably the biggest trap to watch when you're using the camera. Another example, this is the western side of a back veranda. I've got multifold doors there. And you see, normal picture, a bit of boxes of junk sitting there. I didn't try and tidy it up for the picture. You can see the car through the window and the car has disappeared completely. Again, another picture showing that the thermal camera cannot see through glass. What we're seeing here in the, in the glass here is a reflection back into the room and these reddish tinges are the steel purlins. One of the steel purlins that have been reflected in the heat mm. on the roof. So if you wind the emissivity way, way down on the camera, you may be able to start to see something through the glass. But again, you're going to get a combination of reflective thermal infrared that you can't see with the real thermal infrared. Um, this is a shot I took a couple of nights ago. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just experiment again. So let's see if I can work out whether we can see hot water running the pipe. So you can see the pipe, you can see the, the things are cold. So I turned the hot water tap onto the bathroom, ran the tap into the, into the bathtub for a bit, and then took a picture of the, the, outlet, the spout outlet, and this is the, the hot stuff of the actual tap itself. Then I saw all these funny smudgy marks down along the wall. So I don't say I've got a water leak inside the wall, but this is how you check up a water leak, with the colour differential on the wall surface. It's peculiar. So anyway, so I Mur took a couple more shots and I suddenly realised what was happening. That's me. Oh, oh, these, these, these are glazed tiles. Yeah. I cannot see a reflection in the glazed tiles at all. I looked and I looked and I looked. I could not see my image in those glazed tiles, but the camera picked up my reflection in the glazed tiles. And gave a confused yeah. picture because the first picture, I thought, the first time I thought, I thought, oh bugger, I've got a water leak in the hot, on the hot water line. And then I, I suddenly moved the camera thought, hang on, that's my head there. I pulled back as far as I could and took another shot. And you can see my reflection, totally invisible to me. And you then photograph the wall surface and you can be so easily caught out. And for any of you who get the camera, that's the main thing you've got to be very careful with is, is not getting caught out on the on your own reflection or reflection of something else that you can't see at all. So, so that one you can't dial it out with the emissivity? Yes, you can the emissivity down. So I was running on 0.8 emissivity, I think, there. You can see it up there, 0.8. If I wound that down to about 0.3, I probably would have hidden my profile. Completely. Yeah, yeah. I, think oh, I didn't try, but I probably would have. But you'd have to, you'd have to look at doing that, and that, and that would then get you around that problem. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's a quite a good technique you can use. Um, you can, you know, if, you, if you think you've got water leaks and so on, you've got wet areas, you're not sure where the water's coming from, take a thermal image, you can actually see the origins of it because of the cooling effect of the cold water and the warmer walls, but you see the traces where the water is running inside the walls. It's supposed to be able to photograph termites as well because of the heat generated by termites. I haven't found a house with termites in the test I've went out yet. Sand salt down as well. Yeah, it's just another little sort of a quasi gimmicky shot. Um, I had to take three photographs to get the shot of the front of my car with the heat coming out of the engine, the bonnet, the heat oozing out from the bonnet, out through the radiator, you can sort of see all the heat from the car. But I did this after I'd read the, top the data specs about this new camera because it does the edge effects and trims up the edges. So there you can see the edges are all sort of soft and fuzzy. Um, but 
the, this camera will do an image a bit more like that. And all of a sudden you've got the nice edge effects. Uh, and so you get a much, much clearer picture. Although the imaging sensor is about the same size, because I've got to put a small digital camera in there, it automatically blends the standard digital picture with the thermal picture and you start getting lines and edges, you can start to see things. So that's one of the real pluses for that new camera. Um, again, there was three pictures from the car, they had to stitch them together into Photoshop, move the thermal picture into Photoshop, layer them over, rechange the scale so everything lined up nicely. <laughs> It wasn't a two minute job. That'll do it in 30 seconds, in less than 30 seconds or so. Thermal camera will do that nicely. And just to finish off, for those of you with a bit of an artistic bent, you can also use a thermal camera for taking photographs of plants. And then if you join the picture of the plant, the normal picture of the plant, with the heat emitting from various parts of plants, there's leaves, there's, there's a deciduous, there's a salt bush at the back. Um, the other plants at the front which are the bright greens and they all emit different amounts of infrared depending on the thickness of the leaves, the moisture content and all the rest. So if you, you try and photograph some plants you get some quite intriguing colours. But then by merging with my normal picture again I get that nice keen sharp edge and you then get quite a neat little looking artistic picture out of that. So, close to an artistic bench you can grab the thermal camera and try and merge. So admittedly I did play with the colours a little bit and again you take right, the thermal picture, I took six thermal pictures to get that. <coughs> the normal camera takes a nice big picture which is about half a metre by a metre. So I had to take six thermal images, shrink my normal picture, line everything up, re it carefully in Photoshop so that all the leaves lined up. <laughs> so a little bit of fiddling, but interesting uh, result. Was that with sun falling on, on that as um, well? Or that, that was, shade, yeah, or? It was a daytime, so I was actually, the, the normal picture was a daytime, but the um, thermal picture was late in the afternoon when sun was actually off the plants, so it didn't get reflected at uh, visible light. <coughs> and that's it. But, yeah, and, and this, this is the FLIR software as well, you can get um, if you want to write reports, get all fancy about it, you can actually grab a picture um, and then it'll let you do a report, give you details, submit it, print it out, etc. So analysing, report processing, organising, categorising, a bit like your Windows files. Mm -hmm. That's if you want to go that far. With it. mm -hmm. So it's there, there's software there, there's books there, there's a camera there. It's worth playing with. I mean, it's taken, it took the first 12 months I just played with and I thought, how the hell do you use this? And after a year of drive, so people have been hiring for a long time. Oh, you come with it? Then? No. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Ozzy. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.